Um, that's High Square Jackson, East um, Pegasus Square neighborhood, and then uh, Four Corners, uh, Bone Geneva. So literally within a mile, uh, I have basically like at least four or five other main streets. And so we don't, it's not an issue of like competition or anything like that, because I'm just focused on what you may do to improve this neighborhood right here. It's roughly 1.8 miles or it's one square mile. So the size of my main street district is I have between 15,000 and 40,000 people in my district, depending on how far out you want to go or how much of it that you want to include. So if I have 15,000 people, that's roughly the size of a small town. So one of the things we've always asked is what are the interesting records do? So what are the things we do in economic development? That's the primary thing we focus on. And so like for example, this behind me project. One of the issues was that 20% of my storefronts were vacant. And so the challenge was how do I get people to move into that neighborhood, given the fact that the demographics that we're talking to over about in a second. But overall, all 20 of us primarily focus on economic development. Then there's issues on urban planning. So on the city, they're always building, developing, changing infrastructure. So like right now, we're changing Louisville Avenue. So what is it that we think the merchant state, the residents state about the city's proposal, the community prospect, potentially anything like that, bike infrastructure, just parking lots, but you know, what's the bike schedule? So all this is the kind of fact that they were there for So we're involved with that. The infrastructure development, so all the all the trees, sidewalks, crosswalks, parks, lights, everything else, all of that then is and then where it comes into place invested that have to be have to be maintained. So people like myself have to try to keep staying on top of the city to make sure that we keep that up. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to build an attractive main street so people will not come there because again they have a lot of options, up and line, wall, etc. So what do I do? What do we do to make sure that people always want to come to the main street district? So then community development. So we do lots of things to help the community. We mean we have a back to school program. So usually we have about 300 kids. One of the things that we do is we do uh, all the boys a haircut, all the girls are dressed in curl, and we do staff attacks, school supplies, that all the all the farmers and petitions so we can do it, and that's a back to school event. We do holiday Christmas parties, Thanksgiving parties, Christmas parties. Um, so when I had a holiday piece that was Angus Despair, he was primarily was focused on community stuff. He liked the family nights and arts and movies and music and stuff, but that was his thing. And uh, so that's what he did. But usually we are focusing on these things, the community engagement, because like in my particular section, I have 22 different family associations. Now, there's all these different groups who want to know what does the businesses think, what does the residents think, um, all of the politicians, what, is, what do people want? They're, so there's tons and tons and tons and tons of meetings. I usually go to about 100 community events in the course of the year, and then I'm representing that neighborhood. What are our interests? What do people say? What do people want from us, et cetera? So here's all of my list of stuff that we're doing. Anytime there's a new building, anytime there's a new process, they have to go through the community process. So everything from like when we had cannabis, what does the neighborhood think? Is they for it or against it? There's a new, there's a new, you know, six unit housing, whatever. Again, all of those things involve the community process. Then, because it's a nonprofit, all the reporting and compliance, all the taxes, the 990, the LPC, all the stuff we have to do with as a regulation. What kind of programs do we want to put on? And we just had one yesterday for financial literacy for businesses. We work with the SBA, credit, loans, et cetera, fundraising. So again, the city gives us this year 125,000. So anything above and beyond that, we go out and raise on our own. So I do fundraising, volunteer management. So of course, the things are some of my major are very good at managing a pool of volunteers in a much, much bigger events. Uh, technical assistance and, uh, and research, because there's always colleges and universities are trying to come up study problems and what they can do, et cetera. So we can just make things like that. Collaborate with the other directors. Sometimes we act like a trade association because people are trying to figure out how to work with the small businesses. One of the things that happens is from the mayor's office, um, they always have programs, they're trying to get them pushed through. And so they always try to use the main street as a distribution channel. So for example, they had a program for seniors and they said, how do we make our businesses more friendly to seniors? So in that particular case, 
we um, we work with them. They wanted larger trips of venues, larger signage, easier access. Well, that was the program. We have other programs where they said, look, the public health fund said we don't want people using our businesses to shoot up in the bathroom. So we want to make sure that the bathroom, the, the stores have to take the policy. The schools had a program where they said, we don't want young people leaving school and then working in a business. So can you get your businesses to agree that they will not have students work during school college? Those kind of things. So here's kind of what we do, and then here's my district. So I, I, I basically sent the data, as you can see here, I have the poorest district in the city. Um, so the district I have is basically in Dorchester and Roxburgh. So here's all the other neighborhoods, and I'm over here. So most of my neighborhood is black, 30% Hispanic, so basically 80%. Um, a lower education level, people not speaking English at home. Um, another aspect is uh, Brownfield. So I represent three percent of, of Boston, three percent of the city by geography. I'm thirty percent of the city's brownfields. So I do lots of environmental work. Um, violence. So I have the uh, I have the highest homicide rate and most gangs. And so what this district shows is the prevalence of gun use in my neighborhood. And so you can see this thing, which is the highest and the lowest. So this is the highest. This is my district. <laughs> um, so that's the background. The kind of things that we do, um, so it's like seen completely on the opposite of the spectrum, is that we participated. We created an event. There was an event called Mass Innovation Studies. And typically, when we would go to that, it's on high tech. And it's all venture capitalists and you know all that stuff. And we said we in one of those in Grove Hall because typically we don't post events so like all white people and like a few black people or people of color against it. So um, we did our first one. We canvassed the whole state and every black technology founder we could find. And um, what happened is about two months before my event, and I overheard this, I heard two women talking at the previous event, or I was, and one of them said, together, uh, you're not going to go to the Rose Hall that technology event. And I can tell that I have all this work that I put in trying to organize and have this really cool event that nobody was going to show up. And so even though that mailing list had 11,000 people in that community, I quickly pivoted to focus on um, all the black families. So I had I had black kids for entrepreneurship for kids, technology for kids, and it was a, it was a spectacular event. <laughs> Unlike any other one, everybody was black, and there was a few whites there. And so that was highly unusual for a technology event. And I had um, one high school student who said, Oh my god, that was so good. Can you do it again at our school? <laughs> But anyway, so that was an event that we did. Um, it said here is part of our economic development strategy. What we said is that blacks are consumers of technology, they're not producers of technology. In other words, we have smartphones and smart TVs and run social media, we're consuming it, we're not creating it. What do we have to do to be able to be producers of technology as an avenue of economic development? And here was a was one of our sponsors who said that she was getting calls about how good the event was during the event. <laughs> so then here's the thing that we did. I talked about the kind of stuff we do. Again, all this is on this great video. We documented the kind of changes that we were able to make. And so I, I told Julian, I said, just play the video. I don't need to talk. <laughs> but, um, here's all the stuff. All the street lights were out. The trees were visiting. Everything was, it was in really bad disrepair. And so, um, what happened is, for one reason, I don't know, the mayor of Boston, he stood up and he gave his state of the city address and he said, We are launching a main street makeover starting with Mo Geneva and Grove Hall. And so, I, I, I ran up to everybody. What, what is that? What is that? <laughs> nobody, nobody knew what it meant. They didn't know what it meant in this speech and he said it. <laughs> but, I said, how many times everything was broken so long, like a street sign that is screwed loose, everything. And I said, this was the rich big over includes. So we just tried to fix all this stuff, the crosswalks, the, 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 the there was no roll wall sign, like all this stuff. It goes, no, 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 we really were in bad shape. And um 
again, this is just part of it. And you can see how much work there was. Again, this isn't the whole thing, but my last thing was, well, that last little piece here was I was just simply saying, um, we have a case study, if you watch the video, that we can demonstrate that we can make the mainstream four-point approach work, even in an area that's not um, as classic New England. -y. You know, I got the golf course in my, um, in my history. And so checking the golf course and you play golf and I quietly think you're the golf course. And so that was the swing with like a steam fire. With a boom box and a motorcycle. So um, it's not quite like other neighborhoods, but uh, it works. And so what I did is I put this picture up here because um, the Boston Ballet that we would really like to have um, we, the, the people of your neighborhood participating in ballet. And I said, oh, you mean like this? <laughs> and so that's actually in my neighborhood. Um, this is the, that's a health center that we're trying to develop. Um, we've got 25 to 45 million dollars to do that. This is the abandoned building that we're trying to renovate. And this is the show of dance studio that's like right there. And literally what they did is make this, uh, when the stoplight turned, they just had a photographer, the girl red clock, and, did a basket. and I and I just thought this captured the spirit of the neighborhood and what we're trying to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed. I have the pleasure of being Ed um, uh, at the Main Street Now Conference in Boston this past March. And I was sitting here with Jesse, and we're just watching him in awe and in admiration. We're like, we have to get this band for you. <laughs> so, uh, so, and he said it to stay all day, and we'll be talking again this afternoon. And at three o'clock, he's gonna um gonna share um a more depth about the new project with us. So there you have to change. Um our so we choose our next um presentation is uh Michelle McKee, she's the executive director of the Connecticut Nature Center. So, this is going to be the, the clincher. If I can get this to work throughout the presentation, I believe I'm going to get some kind of a prize. <laughs> Oh, we're going to go with it. All right. Well, hello. My name is Michelle McCain. And in addition to being the executive director of Connecticut Main Street Center, I, I believe I have the added distinction of being the newest kid on the block in the world of Main Street today. Um, I joined uh, our, our organization, which is actually close to 25 years old, which like so, you know, uh, I joined the organization only about a year and a half ago, and it is a testament to the power of the Main Street America Four Points methodology that I am already a fervent convert to this approach, and I hope that by the time we're done today, you will be as well. So, for my contribution to today's discussion, I'm going to first provide you with some of the history and the structure of the Connecticut Main Street Center. Again, knowing that Rhode Island, uh, we've been very lucky to have a similar program here because I think we provide a lot of support and help to our Main Street across the state. And um, I will highlight some of those contributions and how that helps with the economic vitality that we enjoy in Connecticut. So, uh, as mentioned, Connecticut Main Street Center is a statewide coordinating program of Main Street America, and our mission is twofold. Uh, one, to support every Connecticut municipality that has a Main Street, a downtown, or a village center that seeks a Main Street experience. And I say Main Street experience because I um, want to make sure to include our towns in Connecticut that have only the bare minimum of a commercial district, which sometimes can be just a single block with a few stores on it. 
Um, to some places that don't even have that, but are actually looking to start a main street from the ground up. And number two, to guide our communities towards establishing an independent entity that is responsible for main street management and implement a management strategy based on the four points. Oh, look, it's moved on its own. It's even better, right? And then it was hurt. Mm -hmm. So um, our support towards accomplishing these goals at the municipal level ranges from offering in-person and virtual trainings and education um, to hosting events that showcase Connecticut Main Street or is a deep dive on a pertinent topic to operating on-site programs in our communities, advocating with state and local uh, elected officials on Main Street favorable policies and ordinances, and providing an annual assessment and ongoing technical assistance, with these activities always being grounded in the four points. Some of our offerings are available to anyone, uh, including you all, by the way. We have had uh, folks from Rhode Island and across the country that come to our online webinar, and others are only for our members. We are a member-based organization with four categories of membership. We have some that are municipal members, so these would include our economic development directors and planners, sometimes they're the chairs of an economic development commission, sometimes they're the chairs of a cultural district, um, and they, they will be our point people as our members. Some of them are professionally managed. So these would be Main Street sort of certified programs, uh, independent 501 trees. And in Connecticut, we have special taxing districts. I don't know if you have this in Rhode Island. Um, they're called either business improvement districts or uh, special services districts. And they are a designated geographic footprint where the property owners actually assess themselves an additional mill tax, and they put that towards a program like a Main Street program that can hire an executive director, and then they do all of the activities that you see are happening in the communities that are being represented here today. Um, we also have regional members, so we work in Connecticut. We don't have county government. We have instead uh, council of government, so we work with them on Main Street issues. And finally, we have multi-district members. This is similar to what we heard described with Boston. We have some cities in Connecticut, New Haven, and Bridgeport that are looking to do what Boston is doing and have Main Street programs in individual neighborhoods. Um, Connecticut has 169 municipalities, which surprises many people because we are a big state, but um, they are all uh, very uh, interested in maintaining those 169 municipalities, those 169 different zoning rules, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to talk for uh, over a year later. And then uh, of the 169, about 90 of them could possibly host a Main Street program of some kind, and more than half of those communities are actually members of the Main Street. Not getting my prize open. <laughs> Okay, I guess we're going to see the slides over and over again. Yes, that would be phenomenal. There? No. Nope. Oh, yeah. The economic case for me is what brought this program to Connecticut. And while I don't have the specific details of our origin story, the gist of it is as follows. Once upon a time, <laughs> a long time ago, someone in Portage. Uh, from Connecticut Lightning Power uh, at the time, now it's ever source, saw the value of Main Street America's testing methodology and the importance of a statewide coordinating program in order to start Main Street programs in our towns and cities. And actually, I was pleased to see how, I don't know if you can this name right, so I apologize, but the, the utility company for Rhode Island is here, which is great. And utility companies actually do play a large role in Main Street programs across the country as partners and uh, funders. Eversource saw that local Main Street programs produced thriving Main Streets and that an investment in a coordinating program that boosted the economic vitality was a good investment for their company. So the hope was that then Governor Jody Rell would follow the lead of the majority of other states in the Main Street America network, over 70%, as you saw, and that she would fund the statewide coordinating program to be housed in the state economic department of uh, economic and community development. However, she, I'm sure, politely declined, 
And instead, Connecticut Main Street was launched and funded by Eversource with a contribution of public funds. And uh, we became an independent 501c3. And our current budget is uh, currently around 50% public funds and 50% uh, private. Next slide, please. So if you would all just take a moment, and actually you were able to see some examples today already, and picture what a favorite Main Street or downtown of yours looks like. The place that you envision has certain qualities that are probably the same as the person sitting next to you. It will look attractive, it will feel welcoming, it will be easy to navigate as a driver or a rider or a pedestrian, if you wouldn't mind. The next slide. I'll just go like this and pretend like I'm doing <laughs> Um, it will have plenty to do in terms of shopping, entertainment, green spaces, art and culture. It could potentially have a place for you to live and start a business. Um, the buildings, the sidewalks, street furniture are well maintained, and the storefronts are all fully used. As a regular person, this is a place where you would want to spend time. If you are a mayor or an economic development director or a chamber of commerce, this is a sign of your successful support of community vibrancy. If you are a developer or a business owner, it increases the value of your investment, the performance of your business, and the retention of your workforce to be located in such a corridor. And if you are a state level official, the more of these thriving municipal main streets you have, the better they contribute to a statewide economic development strategy. Our governor, Ned Lamont, and our commissioner of the Department of Economic and Community Development are focused on bringing new businesses, workers, and residents to Connecticut and ensuring they stay. As part of their strategy, they reference Connecticut's network of interesting and enticing downtowns constantly as places that people want to work, live, and play, and recognizing their contributions to Connecticut's appeal. Picture again that ideal Main Street in your mind or that downtown and all of those components that make it great. It may look easy, natural, organic, but it certainly is not. Think about all of the entities that have an impact on what that streetscape looks like, feels like. Properties need to be developed, maintained, and used in productive ways that keep them attractive and occupied, which requires working relationships with developers and property owners, as well as supportive zoning requirements and possible incentive programs, such as improvement programs or historic tax credits. Um, at the state and the municipal level. For sidewalks and trees to be maintained, <laughs> and streets to, um, and safe, uh, streets to kept safe for pedestrians, cyclists, and others, it requires a partnership with municipal and state engineering, public works, and transportation, and law enforcement, parks and rec, and more. To attract and retain not just successful businesses, but a diversity of business types requires thoughtful curation and recruitment strategy, conversations with chambers and entrepreneur support organizations, the creation perhaps of an incentive program geared to those businesses in the form of grants or revolving loan programs, the marketing and promotion efforts and events to keep the flow of consumers out on the street and supporting those businesses. This engagement includes keeping an eye on your arts and culture sector, making sure that they are supported so as not to only bring audience to the main streets, but more importantly, to make their significant contribution to the quality of life of all our communities. And of course, nothing is static, and this ecosystem also needs to be resilient to changes in the environment from literal impacts of climate change that require flood mitigation or increasing the tree canopy that's for heat mitigation to addressing new workplace um, patterns that may be the presence of office workers and the leasing of office spaces unpredictable to confronting new consumer habits that drive people to shop online rather than locally. Um, are you exhausted by listening to all of the juggling and relationship deciding and the planning and the knowledge that has to be current, also historical, <laughs> and the vigilance required to keep the Main Street coming. It is a lot. And it's more than an economic development director with an entire town or city to oversee, or a chamber with members that are outside the Main Street corridor, or any single property or business owner can handle the loan. I mean, doesn't everyone want to delight them? Right? <laughs> they do. And that's part of our job as a coordinating program is to go around the state of Connecticut. And now I know 
to call and say, and we have some, we're very lucky to have some in our state that, live, that um, can do all of that because they are a mainstream program. Because um, you probably have this experience in your community. You might have that visionary. You might have that visionary who's an economic development person and they're shepherding your main street along either as part of their larger job or sometimes they're even a volunteer, but that does not constitute a sustainable strategy. We all know that when that person retires, things can quickly go south. For these reasons, Connecticut Main Street champions the creation of a local entity that is solely focused on Main Street management staffed by at least one paid employee with the support of a board and stakeholders in order to make our main street thrive. It is an investment strategy that pays off, which is seen in the Main Street America reinvestment certificate. So remember that our mission at Connecticut Main Street is not just the establishment of these entities cast solely with what we're seeing Main Street. It is also that they execute their responsibilities using the four points. Um, you will be hearing a lot, and you already have about the four points. This is our lovely little graphic that has both the four points and then on the in the inner ring and then on the outer ring of all the wonderful benefits that you're going to reap from actually implementing that. It's an amazing strategy. It's um, the method for optimal Main Street management. It provides a roadmap for a Main Street program to operate. It works in towns, cities of any size and composition because they all need to take to pay attention to their design, promotion, economic vitality, and then the organization that manages those things. And of those four points, economic vitality is a standout because it also serves as the measure of the Main Street management success. A successful downtown has few vacancies, a variety of businesses, arts and culture, and consistent food, uh, foot traffic to support the ecosystem. This is where a statewide coordinating program steps into the next, next slide. Our goal is to support the people currently doing the work on Main Street and in downtown. We offer webinars on topics such as how to build big storefronts, what to do about installing public art, how to start a cultural district, which is a program that our state has, um, how to implement a park list. Um, we offer in-person trainings for our members that can be around how do you build relationships with property managers and owners. Um, how do you start putting small-scale manufacturing on your main street, which is really cool because those businesses are very resilient when, I don't know, like a pandemic happens, for example. Um, we host summits. Um, we had one just recently that was um, really interesting. It was um, featuring some of our main street programs in Connecticut that are either partnering with social influencers as a promotion marketing strategy, um, and so this, what was great about this summit is I'm sure people went to it thinking, oh, they're going to tell us how to post on Instagram, but that wasn't it at all. If anything, it was like how to get someone else to do that, which of course I was like, yay, they're holding me. Um, to uh, a neighborhood in Westville, New Haven, that is this magnet for viral um, entrepreneurs. And you will find that there are amazing business owners that started their um, businesses online that are looking for a brick and mortar, and they are going to come to that store with thousands of people who already know them, already like them, and they're going to go where that is. And, and they have a ripple effect across the entire ecosystem. And then you start to see other people coming and doing and everything. My son went to this neighborhood to go to a cat cafe. We have <laughs> But he went and came for this hourly rate and we had some random cat. So I was like, what do you want to do here? We're hosting a, a summit in March that's all about blank and vacancy. It's a huge problem in Connecticut. It's probably a huge problem everywhere with either absentee property owners or they're there but they don't care. And an entire main street can be absolutely tanked by one yucky building. And so we are actually pulling in our state legislators and talking about what are some policy changes we can make like a vacancy tax. Um, or Detroit's doing something really cool, hopefully they'll pass with a land, um, a land use tax. Um, we do spotlight our main events or highlight our communities and we invite people to come to those main streets because that main street is looking for new business owners or new development, et cetera, and we make a point of inviting those folks to come. 
Um, and we do some other on-site programming. We're launching one soon that is called Diversity on Main that is specifically creating those relationships between the property owners, the municipal government, the Main Street program, the entrepreneur support program to start filling those vacancies with entrepreneurs. Um, in addition to providing education, our programming nudges our member municipalities to creating and supporting that independent Main Street entity. One of our key benefits of membership in, um, to Connecticut Main Street is a newly developed um, assessment. I think. Yes. Um, a newly uh, developed assessment tool. So this tool, I have to say, is really cool and very amazing. So what we've done is that we will go into our member community. We're asking questions um, based on the four points uh, with about 85 uh, different data sets. So let me give you uh, an example. And I will say too that this tool is measuring the Main Street's uh, management accomplishments, not the outcomes. So not like the reinvestment statistics that you see. This is like how are you doing and actually executing on these four points. So for example, in the economic vitality section, we have a section on market assessments and a question about having a building inventory that is asking about building owner's name, phone number, address, et cetera. If we go to that community meet and they have no inventory at all, they get a one. If they have an inventory, but it's more than a year old and it's, um, it only has a few of those data points that I mentioned, they might get a two. Uh, if inventory is updated more regularly and it has more information in it, they get a three. And then if it's like digital and searchable, et cetera, et cetera, they get a four. So it's, it's very objective in many ways. And so people know why they got two versus a four. And it gives them then a roadmap to create an assessment report that not only tells them what their score is, it tells them here's what you do to improve on it. And then we connect them to resources. There are resources, the Main Street Americans resources, or it might be a professional affiliate that can do a, you know, a street state improvement plan for you. And then when we come back next year, then you know, hopefully we'll see improvement. And we have found that our members take that to their boards and they say, hey, here's some stuff we have to do. And it's been really helpful for them for that strategic planning, et cetera. So that is a service that we provide to our program. Um, we are doing this to, in like, for example, with the, uh, with the property, the, the building inventory, we are measuring how well that Main Street program knows their properties because we are telling them that this is critical to make sure that those buildings are being fully utilized in a manner that benefits the entire corridor. We're demonstrating that this is an important tool in their management toolbox to have an inventory. And we do this assessment across all four points and over 80 different data sets. And our goal with this assessment is to move our communities towards a Main Street entity because if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide, this is a composite of all of the assessments that we've done so far. And you will see that our professionally managed Main Street programs perform better in our assessment than the ones that are not operating that way. And well-managed Main Street can actually execute on all the best practices and education that we're providing in the state coordinating program. Um, we are far from our goal. Uh, of our 52 members, only 11 are professionally managed, so we are getting there. This is why we as a coordinating program are needed because small towns and cities perform better when the Main Street stakeholders have that go-to person to work with. And by extension, we as a coordinating program are a great partner, not just for our municipal members, but also for the state. Just as it's easy for municipal members, our leaders, developers, small businesses, et cetera, to function at the local level with that Main Street entity that is fully plugged into all that is happening on the ground, it's easier for statewide efforts to be plugged into the local community when there is a coordinating program that is supporting efforts to make great places to live, work, and play. And also to provide critical access to, excuse me, to information to guide regional and state efforts to help communities plan and partner with each other and to share critical information out into that community about funding or policy. Um, if you don't mind, we can slide forward. Regarding the former, we envision our larger goal in assisting the state's economic goals that we will eventually be able to provide aggregate data similar to the reinvestment statistics that we can include also vacancy rates, business ownership, and more to our partners in the 
So I just want to say in conclusion how grateful I am to be with you today because every uh, community deserves a great main street. It's good for residents and visitors and it benefits the entire state and have a network of wonderful places to live, work, and play. At both the local and state level, investing in these youth programs is how to get there. And I know that my state um, would be happy I kept saying uh, live, work, and play. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>
you know, you have to think about Vermont as being one of these quintessential places. You know, think about the charm of the, the historic village and why people visit Vermont. Well, these places, next slide, were in danger. Here's a shot from the early 90s in Bristol, Vermont, uh, which is a small, one of our smaller downtowns. Uh, we were seeing kind of disinvestment in properties downtown um, because of what Chad was talking about, investment in property, easier to develop outside and it's expensive to uh, redevelop historic properties. And so, fortunately, we had a champion by the name of Paul Roof and um, the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And uh, we had the willingness of the administration at the time to kind of start to look at like how can we develop a program that can preserve the integrity, of, you know, the integrity of this place, starting with the preservation of what was already there, and then we can look forward towards some of the brownfields and some of the other areas that were already knocked down and how we develop them. So we started providing carrots, so to speak, for these investments, and they came in the form of historic state tax credits. <coughs> came in the form of brownfield cleanup money and community development block grants, uh, priority consideration for the big grants, next slide. And here's the same place, um, probably taken five or six years ago um, at, a, at an event they had in Bristol. Um, these are the kind of transformations that we've been seeing in Vermont over the last 25 years. The program started in 1998, uh, now 25 years later, we're seeing the fruits of our labor um, by uh, by having this investment, lowering the playing field for reinvestment in the place of Manor Moser. Next slide. So the place of Manor Moser are the gathering places. We have general stores um, you know, scattered around the lot. These are places where people gather and basically um, share, the, share the news of what's happening in their communities. Next slide. Um, obviously, the services that, that are provided in downtown, like hardware stores, the drug stores, um, you know, getting to walk. Well, these places we need, they're walkable, they're easy to get to from our neighborhoods. Uh, we depend on them for the things that we need every day. Next slide. Um, and as I mentioned, we are a uh, safe working program for Main Street America. I just want to emphasize how important it is to have a, a statewide organization that can support those local organizations. We've provided that advocacy um, for them for 25 years. Um, we've gone to bat for them in the legislature. We've battled for funding. Um, we've really tried to be the voice uh, for them. So it's really important to have kind of that coordinated effort at the state level to support the local efforts. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, we have we have 24 uh, what we call state designated downtowns. Uh, they're not all accredited Main Street. Uh, we have some that are accredited Main Streets. We have affiliates. Um, we have some that are the partners um, that are working towards that accreditation. Um, next slide. Um, here's just a snapshot of what we require. We work closely with them. They provide us you know, work plans and budgets. Uh, they provide, we talked about the downtown reinvestment statistics. Um, a really key part of what we do is we provide trainings um, for them, um, give them opportunities to network with each other. We have monthly meetings with each other so we can share ideas. Um, and then they have kind of general compliance that they need to follow in um, order to stay part of the program. Next slide. And here's just a quick snapshot. Um, and I'm not going to go into details. You can see that by providing some, um, you know, some funding, you can leverage a lot of private funding, we can retain jobs, we can retain businesses, uh, and therefore kind of adding to the vitality of the downtown. Next slide. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our Better Places program, and this has been in the, in the making for uh, for about five years. Um, and literally, we were in uh, the committee, committee room uh, the day that everything got shut down uh, during COVID, as they were approving kind of our funding request for two hundred thousand dollars to kind of initiate this program. It totally got you know asked for that year in 2020. But one of the glimmers of uh, you know, positive things that happened out of COVID is we started to see the value move in public spaces um, and gathering spaces when we kind of socially distance. So while it delayed us for a year or two, uh, really gave us the fuel for this program uh, to really make the investment in our in our downtown and the public spaces um, next slide. Um, so with the what is better places is it, is it Imagining how we use state money in a different way. Um, and we we didn't. This is a brand new idea that we came up with. Um, we we worked with Indiana and Michigan and Massachusetts. Uh, we had a partnership with the university. We were learning about their efforts and how they were doing this. Um, next slide. Um, so we decided to um, uh, form a partnership between the Community Foundation and Patronist. Patronist is a platform 
with the crowdfunding platform um, that allows communities to, to raise money and then we can then match it with grant funding dollars. Um, the Community Foundation really was like the, was really the magic behind how to get state money out the door quickly. States are not built for getting money out the door quickly. Um, so we decided we would just take the money, we would pass it over to the Community Foundation so their projects were approved, they could just write text and get it out in real time, like ongoing, so we didn't have to have this review process and decide how many validators to do. Next slide. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly go through kind of how this works. Um, we, we, if this is on a rolling basis, we have uh, communities decide that we have a good idea. We want to put a gazebo up um, so we can have uh, public events. Uh, we want to we think it's going to cost us about $20,000. So they start a campaign anywhere from five to $40,000. They set their time frames in 30 days, or three to five days, we're going to raise some money. If they meet their goal and they meet the program criteria, they get our money. We don't have to review, sit down with a bunch of state folks and, and decide who the leaders are. The community votes with their dollars and they decide what's important. Next slide. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, so if they if they raise what if they raise this scenario, they raise $15,000, they're going to get $30,000 of state money and make the total project value $45,000. Next slide. Um, I've already kind of talked about this. Um, you know, the idea is that we're you know, we're improving the public spaces, which in turn help with, helps with economic development. It helps the restaurants, it helps the shop, um, you know, not just for the visitors coming to Vermont, but also for the very people who live in those communities. They want to be able to have positive, you know, public gathering spaces. So we want to make those investments. Next slide. Uh, the groups that can apply are nonprofit groups or, uh, or municipal groups. Uh, they can use physical sponsors. Um, next slide. And then where we, we kind of dictated around based around our state designation centers. Um, so these are downtowns and village centers and new town centers uh, and neighborhoods that are able to make these investments. Next slide. Uh, and then we wanted to make it easily accessible, not set an annual date because we knew that that wasn't going to meet the needs of the community. We wanted them, as they were coming up with the ideas in real time, we wanted them to be able to apply for the funding so it's on a rolling basis. Um, that we can provide this funding. Um, I will I will mention that we got $1.5 million dollars in one time funding um, that will uh, be expected to run out uh, by by the spring. Um, we actually have to spend the money by June 30th, 2024. So we're going in this year to try to get base funding for the program now that we've got to run it for two years and we know that it can work. Uh, unfortunately it's not really good geographic um, spread and, and it's a lot of communities so we think the legislature is the value of this. Next slide. Um, so I've already talked about this, I'm going to fast going here. Um, and just a quick snapshot on this because it shows you we've got 37 projects um, that have been funded to date and we're continuing to fill the pipeline. Um, and you can see how much we've dedicated uh, um, you know, in funding and how much we've raised. Next slide. And I'm just quickly going to go through just a few pictures of some projects that were funded. Uh, next slide. Um, here's one of Brown Road, which is an old kind of um, ugly looking wall. Um, got artists um, involved with creating this beautiful mural. Next slide. Uh, this was an activation of a street that they're looking, the city's looking to make a one way street to give more, uh, give more room for, for restaurants and seating area, which was very true during COVID here in Rutland. Uh, and then, so they, they activated it by having some events and um, you know, painted crosswalks and kind of imagined what was possible. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, and then they could use the money to do activation of kind of like vacant, vacant lots, uh, underutilized spaces. So this is an event theory happening at John Ferry. Next slide. It's just kind of aerial, the same event. Uh, and what, we'll come back on that. One thing that they discovered in this was making it accessible and free and inclusive was really the most important thing for this community. Because in the past, they charged for events realized that there were some people in the community that were not able to go to the event that they didn't want to bring them pay for each of their kids and the kids are going to get paid for the food. And so they just wanted everyone in the community to be able to access to this kind of community event. And that was really a light bulb for all of our end up. That's really important for them to be free and accessible for all and not to be charged to participate in this community event. Next slide. Uh, and this was a uh, one with Black River in Springfield. And next slide, they turned into a beautiful park. 
Um, and they use it for the various parts. Next slide. How many months? Two minutes. All right. Please. All right. Next slide. All right. So in, in July, you know, the state of Vermont was just pounded with uh, a lot of rain. Um, I live in Montpelier. I live on the hill. Fortunately, my house was not flooded. But within hours, um, you know, of days of rain, you know, the the, uh, the, the entire city got flooded. Uh, next slide. Um, literally every building, just about in your downtown, was flooded with three or four feet of water. Um, every probably ninety-five percent of businesses were, were damaged. Um, next slide. And so I just wanted to. Well, I was asked to kind of speak on this because the importance of having a downtown organization that can help kind of respond. Uh, the director had been in her job less than a year. Uh, the infrastructure of that downtown organization, she had no idea how to handle a disaster, right? Um, but they quickly, because they had that infrastructure, they would have been able to respond, they would provide support and gather resources and whatever information in real time was coming at them to provide some assistance. Next slide. Um, literally, these three people, the guy on the right, um, managed the parks, um, he was told um, the night of the flooding, if you're in charge of the residential, like figuring out like how to respond. In the middle, Katie's the director of Montpelier Lodge. She was told the same night that she was leaving her house to be evacuated to go to Alex's house. She was in charge of the business. So overnight, they spent with their families and decided they came up with a plan. And the plan was to help pull um, the guy who left near Walsh, who had a uh, background in the Navy with uh, running logistics. The three of them put together a massive plan of 48 hours. And over the course of a month, they were able to put four thousand volunteers in a really coordinated way uh, to three hundred and fifty different residents and commercial properties with eight hundred different tasks helping them. Next slide. Uh, and so they also partnered with uh, Montclair Foundation uh, to, to set up a fund to help support businesses because you know the state of money is not bad. Um, businesses needed money like that week. And so they were able to get money out like within within two weeks. They were able to get money into businesses in the form of checks for twenty thousand dollars. Almost done. Uh, next slide. Uh, they were part of we um, as a community. We came together with three different community forums. We talked about um, what Montpelier was going to be like moving forward. What are the important things? How do we build our community for resiliency? Um, so hundreds of people came out to the state house to go to their locations and we talked about it. We prioritized next. Slide, um, and then and then the commission was formed with those list of priorities, forming a group. Uh, it would then charge and uh, raise some money to hire staff to help lead the city, not be relies on the light of that uh, of that commission to help speak for the on behalf of the businesses and the property owners downtown. Next slide. And uh, yeah, we brought the Vermont Strong brand back um, during Trump for my reading in 2011 when Vermont was devastated. Um, that Vermont Strong brand was, uh, was created, it was kind of rebirth during this, and um, we will recover. And fortunately, we're resilient and safe. And so that's all I got. Next slide. Next slide. Um, yeah, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, okay, so here's the plan, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk, and then um, we will we will have all the panelists come up and do questions all together, and we're going to go until 12 to 10, which will reduce our lunch time um, to 50 minutes, but I think that's like plenty of time. So, um, so uh, I'm going to set myself a timer. Um, all right, so I would tell it's important to tell you just a couple of bits about my story and how I ended up here. Um, because I think it's something that maybe happens, happens a lot in your life and there has happened in the past. And that, um, I want to celebrate the fact that we are here in Pawtucket, right? Where, um, uh, where my Main Street journey actually started. So, back in 2017, 
I was hired by Bob Billington from the Black Sun Valley Tourism Council uh, because Bright Up was going to be making significant improvement to Bright, which is right over there. And it uh, starts right here in Kentucky, goes through Central Falls and through Valley Falls in Cumberland. So it's pretty wild, but um, why not use the investment from the state to try to leverage other investment for revitalization in a corridor that is really important to act as one of our state types tourism um, the places that they don't know. Um, but it was, you know, it, it looking, it was looking like that, right? So, um, so, so I was brought in with three communities working together. Basically, we were trying to be a games program. So we didn't know that that what we were doing because Rhode Island didn't have a Main Street program. So I would go and um, tell people what I was trying to do in job, and my meeting businesses, and I was a on monthly stakeholder meeting, and everyone thought it was great. And how do we get a youth in our town to go down to the answer? Yeah, um, and, uh, and even so, with, with all that like demonstration of value, we we couldn't get a chance it. So um so it was funded by, by initial grants. Um, we were able to get renewed once, and then it, it unfortunately went away. And um, and so during COVID, I thought, you know, man, if we only had that, that statewide mainstream program, I had learned about mainstream America, and this is the thing, we can get that here, then efforts like Broad Street, and the, already are out throughout our city, would have that, that foundation and support. We could build an understanding of how this works and why it's worthy of funding. And, Return on investment proven in all these other places for years and years and years. So, here. so um, I knew the most part of uh, had been just starting to stick their toes into thinking about this. And so, uh, here we are today. So, um, so we heard a little bit, we heard about um, the Connecticut program. We kind of talked a little bit about how um, Main Street America is structured. I want to reiterate that um, so with these slides are just going to play. Um, and also, if like any of them that have words on them, um, they're taken from the um, the proposal that's on our website. So you don't have to write email and you can just download it. Um, so 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 we don't exist yet. I want to make that clear, right? Like the Main Street Road Island is still a proposal, and um, and we 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 um, are it's just like represent a new capacity for Rose Road Island, um, and. Uh, Anyway, we think we think that we are the appropriate organization to be doing it uh, because of the overlap of mission, um, and because we, we certainly don't want yet another nonprofit organization. We want to um, try and, and uh, be efficient. The whole nature of this, this whole operation. So, um, I do want to recognize right away how much great work is already being done in Rhode Island at the local level. Um, and I also I want to say, you know, we have fantastic, um, we have chambers of commerce, we have merchant associations, we have neighborhood associations, we have the head network from the Department of Health, um, friends groups. I mean, we're just we're all coming out of the work from different angles, and we don't have that centralized network that connects all of us that are doing um place-based revolution and economic development. So that is what we are supposed to do. Um Let's see. Um, yeah, I mentioned already, do you like Connecticut? That's the bottom. And you know, like, for every lot of So, um, so I want to say, uh, say uh, you don't necessarily think, especially if you get started, that, um, that every group has to, you know, start up right away as a you know, main street or kind of program. We know it's where um, this, is, this is something we we're going to want to start with our statewide coordinating program. We want to start with foundation. We don't want to replace any of the existing efforts that are out there, but we want all of you to participate in the network. Right? So, um, so I don't want that to be clear. Uh, we would be that, um, that centralized connecting tissue for all of our place based efforts around the state to come together, to learn, to grow, and actually support the system. Because it's easier to build community when you yourself have a community of community builders. Okay? So, um, so I said before, we're going to start small and grow. You know, the concept is new to Rhode Island. Um, we're going to start somewhere, and then having this statewide program will support local efforts. 
So, um, uh, yeah, what I, what I want to just uh, emphasize is that um, uh, I've been trying to seek grants for this program. And to be simply having a challenge in any city like grants are not set up to support staff, not support staff to support the ongoing work. And so, um, so we're still working on it. And, um, and one of the things I'm so happy about all of you here today um is that now we have we have a network and a hopeful advocate so if you are not convinced by the end of today i want you to call me and we'll get involved because i think that we will i know we'll be able to change the mind but um but if you do think it's a good idea and that we should have this in our um i want you to take that survey that you hopefully got when you walked in the door um, and and I want you to get into to helping make this happen in some way. So um, Scott likes to talk about our involvement in different projects. We have three tiers. So there's um, we're going to be a leader, we're going to be a supporter, or we're just going to be in the amen corner, right? Which means that yes, I think that's great as well. Um, so in the survey, I mentioned a bunch of different tasks that I think fall under each category, and I'd like you to put yourself in. in and category two, I might be willing to do these things to help make this happen. Um, and make sure you turn it in there in the basket on your way out. Um, so you can drop it in that basket um, with your email address. So um, that can be important because I'm excited to share that we um, are going to be finally launching a separate Main Street newsletter, Main Street Web newsletter, um, sometime in the first quarter of 24. Um, it's going to be separate from the first quarter of the so if you want to be a part of that mailing list, um, you have to opt in. So um, if you provided your email and registered today, I'm going to go ahead and add you. Um, and if you put your email on the survey, I will go ahead and add you. And if you want to tell other people,